I'm a software developer, and I love what I do. I love the challenges that programming brings, and there are many of those. Ten years ago, I started to think about what can I do to improve, and my decision at that time was to pick up psychology. Because programming is not just about machines, programming is about people too. It's about how we think, reason, solve problems, and also how we communicate and work well with others. So psychology has a lot to offer in this traditional technical area. And this is a story about just that. We programmers, we don't just write code. I mean, sure, we do that as well. But when you look at it, what we do most of the time is making modifications to existing programs. And the majority of that time is spent trying to understand what the programs do in the first place. And that means if we want to improve any aspect of software development, we should optimize for ease of understanding. This is a challenge, and here's why. It's because this is a visualization of a software system. Does it look complicated to you as non-programmers? I'm a programmer, and it looks terribly complicated to me. And I'm doing this all day. And that's part of the problem. We just don't know which parts that really matter. We don't know where we spend our time and efforts. And this is a problem that gets worse with scale. Because today's software projects are developed by multiple developers working in multiple teams. And that gives everyone their own view of the system. No one has a holistic picture. And the software world hasn't really come up with a good solution to this. So that's why I suggest that we look into a different field, a field that faces similar, open-ended, complex questions as we do. Welcome to forensic psychology. You probably all know a little bit about forensics. Perhaps you've seen CSI, or you read about offender profiling in the media, and also bet that most of you have seen the movie Silence of the Lambs. And I'm pretty sure that you all agree with me that Hannibal Lecter is the coolest character. <laughs> First time I saw that movie, I was quite influenced by Hannibal Lecter. And I don't mean that in a scary way. I was influenced by his, by his offender profiling skills, not the other stuff. And when you think about it, it's quite, quite amazing what he does. Because Hannibal Lecter sits there locked up in his cage, and he receives information about the crimes. And from that information alone, he manages to deduce not only the personality, but also the motives of the offender. And when I saw that, I was like, wow, I want to learn that. And years later, as I started to study criminal psychology, I got terribly disappointed. Because it turned out those techniques that Hannibal Lecter were using have a serious limitation. They only work in Hollywood movies. <laughs> but fortunately, we get some more scientific methods. And that's what I want to talk about now. So please allow me to give you a two minutes introduction to geographical offender profiling. Geographical offender profiling is based on statistics and environmental psychology. It's about how we interact with our environment. It's also based on the fundamental fact that criminals, most of the time, behave just like us. They go to restaurants, they go to the movies, they visit friends, and perhaps they even pick up the kids from school. And as they move around in an area, that's where they spot opportunities for crime. Because for a crime to occur, there must be an overlap in time and space between an offender and a victim, right? So this is information we can use, because the, that means that the crime scenes, their geographic locations, are never random. They contain information about the criminal. And that information may help us locate their home base. Here's how it works. In that beautiful gray house, there lives an offender. And he has spotted an opportunity for crime, so he strikes. Commits his first crime, and now he knows that there's an increased risk with returning to that area too soon, because he may be recognized. So the next time he commits a crime, he moves in the opposite direction. Now, there's an increased risk with returning to that area again, so he strikes in yet another direction, and so on. And over time, these crimes, their distribution, form a pattern, a circle. And 
in the middle of the circle, that's our likely home base for the criminal. Well, the real world is obviously a little bit more complex. And the real world geography is much more complicated. As a consequence, real world geographical offender profiling has to be a bit more complicated. Here's how it looks. What you see now is a map of 19th century London, the Whitechapel area. The streets that Jack the Ripper haunted. And those, those blue dots, those are the crime scenes of the Ripper. His murder scenes. And what you do in geographical offender profiling is that you consider each crime scene a center of gravity. And then you weight them all together, but with one psychological twist. Psychologically, all distances aren't equal, so crime scenes that are closer to each other get assigned more weight. And when you do that, you get a new center of gravity, and that's the red area in the middle. That's our hotspot. And according to the research, there's a 70% chance that the offender is located there. All right, we all know that Jack the Ripper, he was never cocked. So, who was he? I'm sure you want to know if this profiling stuff works. So let's look at the main offenders and where they used to live. The first one is my own personal favorite suspect, Mr. James Maybrick. He used to rent a room in Middlesex Street. And look where Middlesex Street is, right in the middle of the hotspot. So, James Maybrick fits the profile. If you read the news lately, you probably heard about the supposed DNA evidence in the Ripper case. Supposed DNA evidence that linked one of the suspects, the hairdresser Aaron Kosminski, to the crimes. And Kosminski used to live at Zion Square. And here's Zion Square. It's a little bit east of the hotspot. So Kosminski is not as good a fit as Maybrick. But the important thing here to realize is that a geographical offender profile doesn't point to a precise location. A geographical offender profile gives us a probability surface that we can use. And when I learned about this stuff the first time, I thought like, all right, what if we had something like this in the software world? Because look what we're doing. We're taking this potentially vast geographical area, and then we narrow it down to a much, much smaller area. A small area that we can focus our human expertise on. What if we could do the same for software? What if we could take those large, complicated systems and narrow them down to a few hotspots? A few hotspots where we can focus on human expertise and inspect manually. That would be a huge win for the software world. But how do we transfer these techniques to software? First of all, we would need a geography of code. Here's how that could look. This is Code City where software systems are visualized as towns. And each part of the software is visualized as a building. And you see that some buildings are much larger than others. And that's because the size of that software part is much larger. So the larger the building, the more software behind it, the more code. And one can make the case that, well, a huge building, much code behind it, that's probably the most complex part. Does that make a building a hotspot? No, it doesn't. Because complexity alone is never a problem. Complexity is only a problem when we need to deal with it. And perhaps those large buildings, perhaps uh, those have been stable for years. We never need to look into them. We never need to understand them. Then we probably have much more urgent matters that need our attention. To find those, we need to add a dimension to this city. We need to add the spatial movements just as we did for the criminals, but this time for programmers. And that's data that we actually have today. We're just not used to think about it that way. Because all programmers are using something called a version control system. Each time we make a change to the code, a small entry gets recorded. And this is an example of the kind of information you will find. You will see the name of the programmer, you will also see when the change was made, and most importantly, you will see where in the code the change was made. And this is spatial movement for a single programmer making a single change. A large system has literally thousands of these entries 
So what if? What if we take that data, aggregate it, and project it onto our geography of code? Here's how that looks. You see those red areas lighting up? That's spatial movements of programmer making changes to a system. And this lets us identify a hotspot. And the hotspot in this case is an overlap between complexity, as measured by size, and spatial movement. That is complicated code that we have to work with often. And when humans have to deal with complicated things often on a regular basis, things often go wrong. That's why the hotspots are interesting. And I start to look into that. We know that this geographical offender profiling technique works for crimes, but how does it work for software? To answer that, I performed a case study. And this case study is done on a popular open source software project that's used for database access in the programming world. This is a fairly large system, consisting of 400,000 lines of code, had 89 programmers working on it, and they made a lot of changes. Here's how the hotspots look. You see that I moved back into a two-dimensional world? That's because it gives me a better overview of a large system. It's also a bit more reminiscent of the maps we used earlier for geographical offender profiling. And even here, we can spot a few hotspots. Now, remember, those hotspots were defined as an overlap between complex code and spatial movement. But what does that actually tell us? What happens inside a hotspot? What kind of code will we find when we look into it? To answer those questions, I looked at the bugs in the system. And this system, like almost every other software system, has an uneven distribution of bugs. That is, some parts, a few parts, are responsible for the majority of all bugs. And it turned out that the hotspots we just identified, they identify seven out of the eight most defect-dense parts. Even more interesting, that the hotspots only make up 4% of the code, yet that code is responsible for 72% of all defects. Or put another way, if we improve just 4% of that code, we get rid of the majority of the defects. And that's a huge increase in quality for a minimum of investment. And the hotspot analysis tells us exactly which parts we need to improve. So, before I leave you, I want to look a little bit into the future, because there's a growing body of research on these topics. And I'm trying to contribute myself. I'm writing a book right now called Code as a Crime Scene. And here's some of the stuff that I look into. What you see here is a communication diagram. Each dot represents a programmer, and the color of that dot represents the team the programmer belongs to. Now, this is obviously not your typical organizational chart. That's because this one is based on reality. This one is recreated from the source code that these programmers created. So what I did was, I took this version control data, and I looked into it, and as soon as I identified two programmers working in the same part of the system, those two programmers get a communication link between them. And the more they work in the same parts, the stronger that link. And this diagram lets us identify some core developers. These are developers that have a lot of communication links. These are obviously quite central to the product you're building. What if one of these developers leaves? You will obviously get a knowledge gap. But how large is that gap? That's a question we can answer with the same data. Here's how that looks. You see those orange dots? There are no hotspots here. What they show is abandoned code. That is, code that's written by a programmer who's no longer in the company. So this is a way to illustrate loss of knowledge. And this is information that should that show that these techniques go beyond programming. That these techniques are useful to technical managers and technical leads as organizational tool. They give them information about the knowledge distribution in the product you're building. So forensic psychology is useful to software developers too. It helps us identify the parts that are in need of our attention, the parts in need of improvement, and 
the parts of the software that are most prone to bugs. And that gives us time to react early. These techniques are also useful to managers as organizational tools. Finally, we in the software world, we have this info amazing informational data source in our version control systems. And it's an informational source that we're virtually ignoring today. The time has come to change that. Thanks.